listening to Shoot It Now, your weekly podcast about indie filmmaking and big budget films with award winning filmmaker Craig Newland. And welcome to another Shoot It Now podcast. My guest today is an award winning cinematographer who has got film credits to his name that includes the Robin Williams film Cadillac Man, the Van Damme films Nowhere to Run, and The Quest the world's fastest Indian starring Anthony Hopkins. And he's also been working in Canada for a number of years on multiple series for the Tom Selleck, Jesse Stone. David Gribble, welcome to Shoot It Now. Hey, it's good to be here. Mate, good to have you on the show. And I should point out that David and I have worked together. In fact, David was my first cinematographer for a short film that I made back in 2008. And it doesn't feel like 13 years ago, but it's as crystal clear as yesterday to me. Yeah, I can remember a lot of that with the red camera. And it was a good opportunity to do some drama with a red camera. As mentioned, you have a number of films to your filmography, which spans over four decades. Uh, just from a technological point of view, the arc of growth within the film industry has been such a curve. And I remember back in 2008, you agreeing to shoot my film, as you said, because you wanted to play around with red technology. And when you think back to 2008, the red was fairly new technology back then. It was, it was. Gladly, those red ones have disappeared into the history of time. I used another one on one of the Jesse Stone pictures and sort of little things like, oh, the camera assistant says, I've lost that take. I love the digital stuff. I would never go back to film. So are you keeping pace of all the technology and everything that is changing, which is rapidly changing? Uh, yes, I have a, a theory that when you see new change, embrace it so that you work out how you will work with it rather than it telling you the other way around. <laughs> it's quite interesting because many people will find that somebody that has worked with film as much as you have because you've shot more on film than digital, that you've embraced the digital and you'd never go back to film. Basically, I would never go back. I mean, you know, I light by eye anyhow, so it hasn't affected me that way. Some people who, who couldn't light now can light because they can see, you know, what they're doing. There's no like, oh, how many more takes are we going to do? We're running out of film. You know, it's, a, it's now it's like, oh, you're, you're shooting too much data, which can be a bit of a problem. And it can show a director, this is how it's going to look. You know, this is, sometimes this is, this is the best it's ever going to look when you look at those big monitors. But uh, with film, it was always had to keep explaining, oh, the video tap isn't really representing how it's going to be, you know. And before video taps, it was they just have to look at you and trust you, you know. So I've come through the whole, uh, whole situation of explaining to directors in different ways what the image is going to look like, you know. So you're preferring digital to film for a whole raft of reasons, particularly around the speed aspect, uh, playing back to, to the director. But what about the actual look of film versus digital? Because there's a lot of guys and women that have worked in film that just want to carry on shooting in film rather than embrace the digital look, the aesthetic of the digital. If they're not embracing change, they're not moving forward, you know. And I can sort of understand how some younger DPs of having worked with film want to sort of, I want to shoot film, I want to shoot film because they haven't done it. Digital takes a, a little edge of worry out of, you know, so you can move forward quickly. But I always actually working on correct exposure can cause a bit of stress. With digital now, you don't have that worry. You can move forward uh, a lot faster. You don't have to explain, uh, now it's not going to be quite as dark as that. Can you hear them in the darkness? That let's rely upon the sound department for as he steps over the fence. You don't have to see things all the time. You have to keep explaining that. Whereas now it's on the screen there, and they can look at that. It's like looking at the finished product almost. You know, I just see no reason to go back to film. Everything's gradable. You know, even when there was film, there were people panicking if something, if the particular rushes came back a bit warm or a bit cold or something. Production office was off booking cameras for a reshoot. You know, you go, hey. It's, it's gradable, you know, you just grade everything. In fact, that's why American DPs always ask for a, a reprint so that when the editor and the director are sitting there for a month cutting and they got used to this strange cast on the film, they didn't get to the end and he graded it properly and suddenly they're going, what have you done? You've taken away the look that I had. 
now, you can put a, a lookup table to it. You can decide that beforehand. The whole thing about directors for DPs is finding out what their intentions are and what, what they want to do. Like, you know, you can sort of wine and dine a director and chat for weeks. Uh, you know, you arrive in Hollywood and you're chatting away and the whole thing. And you eventually find out exactly what he or she wants to do. And uh, it may be as little as sitting next to the camera and talking to the actors. Or maybe, oh, I want to operate the camera or basically take over the lighting or, you know, all directors have a different approach to things. So when you find out exactly what he or she wants, what's left is uh, your job. And coming back to film, what would you say to Quentin Tarantino if he said, David Gribble, I want to shoot a film with you on film because he, he hates digital so much? Yeah, well, you'd shoot on film. You'd have to pick out the old exposure meter. I've learned uh, over the years uh, shooting digital that it's not worth pulling the exposure meter out because it's not the same. Or you may do it on day one or something, just to, on your test or something. But I tested one with an ARRI with the, the inbuilt NDs, right? So you go, okay, I'll do a uh, quick test out in the daylight. You know what the exposure should be at a certain rating and check with the meter. And then you go, okay, let's click in the two stops ND. Okay, now open up two stops and you go, hang on, it's not the same. So therefore, the NDs are not accurate. So put the meter away <laughs> for the whole shoot after that. <laughs> so if you can't rely upon the NDs being correct, because they don't have to be exactly, and they may vary from camera to camera. This was a couple of years ago, but it may be different now. And if they've got wedges in built inside, it may be like a graduated thing. So you really don't need the meter anymore in a digital thing. I want to look at anyone looking at their first film to shoot. He or she don't hesitate to get in touch with a professional cinematographer because the worst thing that can happen is that they say no. And I was living in Queensland, Australia at the time when I started to look for a cinematographer and people listening to this podcast already know that I didn't go to film school. I found you, of course, Gribbs, on IMDb and saw that just a few years prior, you had shot the Roger Donaldson film, The World's Fastest Indian. So I got in touch with you. At that point, you asked if I had a script, which I could send you, which I did. And we spoke about a week later and you said to me, it was interesting. <laughs> and so I thought, OK, that's my chance to jump on a plane, fly to Sydney to meet with you. And then the film was made. So indie filmmakers shouldn't just restrict themselves to film people that they know, perhaps people that they went to film school with, uh, bring in somebody to be that cinematographer, because you can find a cinematographer, if they like what you're doing, who has a lot of experience like you. And for those people wanting to know the budget on this, I was kind of fortunate because I was in a situation where I was running a business prior to getting involved in the film industry. So I actually had money that I could spend, which was $50,000. So my $50,000 was on a short film that I brought in an experienced cinematographer. And from there we went on. And that was my film school in many ways. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, I guess... Putting yourself into the, the shoes of a, a new director, I can understand how they go, oh my God, I don't want some old DP telling me what to do. But I guess you still got to pick the right DP. I can remember stories of, I'm not trained to disagree with a director. You're like a knight, you know, setting out to sort of do what the king sort of uh, has asked. And so even if you didn't agree with maybe a suggestion, it's quicker to set it up, do it or show the shot, then sit there arguing for an hour, which I know some DPs have done, arguing and say, I'm not trained to argue, I'm trained to, to do it. And also, I have a theory about suggestions. You uh, suggest something three times, once, and then you may wait a bit, and then you say, suggest it in a different form, and then you're through the time. Once you've suggested three times, it's like, forget it, you move on to something else, you know? That is a sort of a system I use. And also, like, as I said, if the director has, you can try to explain that physical problems of what a director has suggested, and it may even be a money money problem, you know? So you have to make all those facts evident, but then the object is still to do what the director wants. 
And I think that that's really to your advantage because first time director doesn't know really how the shoot is going to go, doesn't know how the cinematographer is going to interact with them. And because you had all this knowledge and I had zero, you were so accommodating. And that was only through an experience because I didn't know what to expect. And you've done this before. You've worked with other first time directors. And because of the way that you work, Obviously, the vision is always there for a cinematographer to embrace, understand and have that through line. But it is to your advantage the way that you work, Gribs, for sure, without a doubt, because that just made the whole process so much more fun. Yeah, and it should be fun. <laughs> you know, if it's not fun, we should give it up, I think. I mean, there are times when there's some days are certainly not fun. And the funny thing is you work two or three night shoots in the worst conditions and then it gets cut out of the movie. But that's that's part of the deal, you know. But there are times when, you know, the relationship between a director and a DP can be strained. I can remember shooting, um, I'm just thinking of a first-time director who was a, a writer, a very successful writer, done a deal with studios. He'll supply them with so many scripts and he gets one to shoot, you know. I worked out later on he was visually dyslectic. So I had to sort of explain an idea. I had to set it up with the camera and light the whole thing. So... And then he could go, oh, okay, uh, you know, so that's not very uh, efficient. I can, I can remember a case in, in Thailand, a curved arch bridge, right? The two actors, lead actors, Willem Dafoe and Gregory Hines are chatting on this bridge and it's arched up. And so to light something like that, uh, if you've got playing ground either side, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, if you haven't got really high man lists for lights and stuff like that, it's going to be a challenge anyhow. So it was like over these... Uh, little houses on the water, the native sort of huts and things like that running off in the distance. So that's the background. You go, okay, we're here. We shoot that background running down there. I had electrics crawling through crocodile infested water almost, running cable to put some little practicals down this thing. And it looked quite good in the end. You got these two guys chatting and it's like off into the distance. The director turns up to look at this after we've been lighting from dusk onwards, you know, and goes, no, oh, no, no, drop the camera down. I want my actors to be heroes and you're looking at ground level, you look up into the black sky. So you're thinking, well, we could have shot this damn in the car park, you know? So he visually didn't appreciate that effort or even the, the, the storytelling of it. But I did learn later on that he'd gone back to drugs. So, you know, opium was too easily available in Thailand. So that's why, one of the reasons why I couldn't see, seem to get the correct information from him. So that's, that's not... A normal thing. Uh, I tell that story because it was stood out as an example of how tough it can be if you have someone that doesn't have an image in their head, even when you explain it, until it's actually up on the screen on location after two hours of lighting and, and setting up and actors rehearse and that stuff. So that is just, and I don't, I like to be efficient. I like to move fast. Uh, I don't like to sort of dawdle around too much. Time is of the essence. It just means you can get more shots for the director if you're faster. And, and some setups uh, like a B camera is a beautiful thing. You know, I, like, I, I do like working with two cameras because it preserves the continuity of the lighting. For me, uh, lighting is very important because the lighting is the mood of the scene and it enhances the acting and enhances everything. In fact, on that same film, an example of how you can work with an actor uh, with lighting is... Uh, with Willem Dafoe, he was sort of beat up and lying in a corner or something like that. And it was a very important speech to his partner at that point. And I just put a beam of light in front of him. And I said to him, uh, Willem, uh, I've got a beam of light running across front there. If there's something in this speech that you want to accent a bit more, if you lean forward at that point, it'll the light will pick it up. It'll enhance what you're you're about to say. So he goes, right, and I watched his whole take. He's not going to lean forward ever. <laughs> and then he does, and the, towards the end, he does, you know. So, and then if you do multiple takes, he will always do that at the same time. So you have continuity. So you, if you leave that decision to the actor, it can benefit you. Another thing is like with actors, you know, standing near a window and, and yeah, you got marks and actors don't necessarily hit the marks. And that's why it's good to have a, a light meter. You can go up and talk to an actor. You can pretend to take a reading even. And, and you go, yeah, oh, wow, you look really good here. Man, you know, really good. That actor will hit that spot. 
every time. But if, if you say, this is your mark here, you have to be here, uh, it's a demand. You know, it's not like uh, their decision. So that, I've learned that, you know, particularly a female actress who wants to look really good. You know, oh, man, you look really good here. <laughs> and all you know, Jean-Claude, Jean-Claude, oh, man, your muscles. Gee, you know, and he, Jean-Claude would hit a mark like a millimeter to spare. He was just fantastic at hitting marks. He just could never remember my name. And he called me Bill, you know? And I go like, uh, uh, Jean-Claude, uh, not Bill. And then on the last day of shooting on one of the films, I said, tomorrow, Jean-Claude, it's the last day of shooting. I want you to remember my name. So we're on set <laughs> the next day shooting. And, and, he, and he goes, that, that. And he looks at me, he wants to talk to me. And, and you can see he's about that. And he's going, I can't remember his name. And, he's, and he, he went, oh, oh, okay, no, nothing, it's fine. <laughs> But I like John Floyd. He was, you know, he was, he was good. Another aspect of directors is that they worry about when they first start out, and it's around the technical side of shooting a film. I'm sure a lot of directors have put off making a film until that they feel more technically capable of camera lenses, lighting, framing, composition, blocking, and so the list goes on. And if you're good with story and working with actors and other departments like, say, production design, and you have a highly competent cinematographer who is able to bring everyone in around the camera, you don't need to worry about every aspect, every technical aspect of what a cinematographer knows. So any advice, Gribs, around that, that whole issue where some directors just want to be too technically knowledge-based before they get on and shoot their first film? Yeah, I mean... I've had that where a director wants to embrace, you know, this lens is that, and I watched a movie and stuff like that. I guess it's their little crutch to lean on a bit, you know, uh, to give them confidence to move forward. It shouldn't be rejected by the DP. And even though they may be talking about some fine detail that you don't even know, you know, I just, you just got to go with the flow of things and you adopt uh, an attitude that that is what's driving the director. The technical side so wants uh, to shoot the whole movie on a 40 mil lens or something because he's seen a movie that did that and they were bullshitting anyhow and they never, <laughs> and it's publicity, you know, uh, and you, you look at that film and you go, hang on, that's not a 40 mil. But the funny thing is working on movies and commercials, I used to do like maybe a year and a half of shooting TV commercials and then do a movie. So after doing that many commercials, you want someone to get all the way to the to the door and open the door and get in the car, something longer than the two second shots that TV commercials are, you know. And then after a movie, you really want someone to sell you dog food and sit at a desk you know, to sort of, so you can have a, you breeze through and just take the money. So what perhaps is one of the more stranger requests from somebody who is putting on the inverted commas I know all there is to know about cinematography and has yeah. requested something really bizarre. Can you give us something well, really? Well, yeah. Um, it's a case of like you have to set something up like I explained. I remember a, a director wanting to had set up a whole length of track for the full length of the studio to track into a person but wanted to track on forward on a like a 300 mil or the long end of an Ongino Zoom, 2250 or something like that. And you tried to explain that you're not really gaining anything you have to travel 20 feet to get a bit tighter because you know you're on a long lens and therefore every little up and down is going to be seen even if you had a computer control one it still would be the tracks would be every little bump you know so we set it up and of course it was just like so rough looking on a normal track in any little move is absorbed in the move forward uh, that's why sometimes people say, oh, this is too rough a ground here. And you go, no, you're moving forward. Even handheld, the same thing. If you, you go moving forward, a bump is over 10 feet. It's not a bump that's like boom, you know, it's not like a, a short bump. But with a long lens, every little bump is like really visible. So we set this up. It was ridiculous. It was just awful. And it wasn't because of skill of dollying or operating just wasn't going to work. and But they had to set that up to show the director. And then you go, oh, okay, okay, I've got that now. And it's the same with the, the old, um, the dolly in zoom out or the, you know, the reverse zoom thing, which I've done quite a few times over the years for an actor to look as though they're confused or something like that uh, because the background changes and the actor sort of stays the same size. Sometimes you'll set that up as per director. You track back 
and you're always on the operating, always going, could you operate on commercials? You go like, oh, okay, I'll just do it a reverse. And you say, hey, it looks better going the other way, you know? So, and then you can show the director. And I do play with directors sitting at a monitor. If you feel a director doesn't take suggestions, you can let a director find a shot by doing it with the camera in between takes. You may want to suggest something really long lens or something, and then he or she may go like, oh, let's do a tighter version, you know? So you go, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I want to look at the Anthony Hopkins film, The World's Fastest Indian, because here was a very ambitious film shot in different countries. Can you remember how many days to shoot the film and what your camera setup was on The World's Fastest Indian? Well, we shot in uh, Utah first, and I think that was like four or five weeks, and then I think there was two and a half weeks in New Zealand. Uh, we were talking about, well, this is this was film then, right? So there was a system going around where you had three-frame pull-down as opposed to four. There was no spare negative top and bottom to play around with, uh, but Roger wouldn't give me an answer. It takes a little while to, to give you an answer on things like that, so... You want to test the gear, you want to do stuff. And I think it was like about you know half a week before we were shooting, before we, okay, we're going to shoot three perfs. So Roger could do more takes. He likes a lot of takes. So, but I was pretty busy anyway. I was like, you know, we're shooting on the salt flats. You go, okay, uh, have you got one of those special shot making uh, things here? No. Okay. And we can't afford to bring one from Hollywood. Okay. So I said, I could take me out to, what's the biggest crane in town? You know, they take me out to that, look at that crane. Okay, okay. So what's the best tracking, biggest tracking vehicle you got? Take me to that. And I go, okay. Okay, get that crane and put that on that tracking vehicle. Oh, really? And there was another bit where I was trying to work out how to get decent close-ups when Tony was on the bike. So I thought of maybe a low, low, low loader and then have so you can move around it or something. And I drew up a few of these things. But another one was like uh, dragging a bike behind, you know, behind a tracking vehicle. So in the end, we we did that purely for him to get into it from a walking thing and just to start. But these things get out of, you know, get a bit exciting and everyone's tracking. Once again, you're doing 100 miles an hour, uh, you know, and Tony's in the bike and you're moving around. You've got three cameras or something going. So all those things, they look really good. So they've got like authenticity. I suggested to Roger that a good shot for after the stunt may well be lying the bike on its side with Tony in it, Anthony Hopkins in it, and put a, a bit of pipe through the bike and then just run around at sunset because it's late light and put a camera on, on it looking at his face. And so just run around, run around, run around. And I just imagined that Roger and I would be out there maybe with a focus puller and the grips rigged the and it seems like we shoot it after wrap when basically the main crew is finished and you're not costing a lot of money, you know? So anyhow, we go out there, right? We get Tony in the bike and I suddenly see there's like 25 people, you know, makeup, wardrobe, assistants. There's all these people, you know, and you've got to rotate 360 degrees. You think, oh, man, I have to get rid of these in post. So we got them to line up in a line. So there's only one person to get rid of as you came around. That was fine. Okay, we're going to roll. We did one. We ran around. Roger and I, like schoolboys, doing their first film, running around, pushing a bit of pipe. We go around a couple of times. Tony screams out, da 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 da. Then we cut. And I thought, hmm. I thought it was a bit for the stunt, which was fairly light on. It wasn't like I thought it was a bit over, you know, myself personally. And it's not up to me to uh, tell an actor how to act. But I was hoping for a second take. And sometimes you don't get that second take, so you have to speak up. But you have to be careful with your words. So we're, we're sitting there and Tony goes, Gribs, Gribs, Gribs. <laughs> what, does he want to go? Because he's a bit tight and he's been rubbing his shoulder on the salt as it goes around. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, no, he wants to get out. And once you get out in a low-budget movie, that's it. There's no, you don't get back. There's a mob of people around, standing around, and he goes, Gribs. And I lean down and he goes, what am I doing here? And I went, what? He said, I'm 69 years old. What am I doing here? Like, he was taking in the whole scene. He was having a philosophical moment about what the hell he'd been running around, just lying on his side, you know, and it wasn't anything to do with, like, he wanted to get out of the bike, and I was so relieved uh, that we did another take. And because the bike moved around a bit, the bonus was we saw the black line. Now, for some reason, it had worked its way. So when we rotate, we see the black line, which was down the middle of the, of the drive, which was fantastic. If you tried to get that and move it, no, you don't. 
and he did a lesser of a reaction. And when you see the film, you see both big reaction and the lesser reaction in the cut. So it was good. And as I mentioned, it's a very ambitious film and it could have all come to a close on the Salt Lake Flats because there was a storm that blew through. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, Anthony Hopkins was really fantastic. He wouldn't work to the scale of, you know, what the deals are for actors. He would would work like the extra day or go a bit longer. And in fact, if he didn't, I would have thought the film probably would have stopped because he worked on a weekend or something so we're able to finish on a certain day. The next day, a massive storm came through that night and blew the set away totally and put 600 millimetres of water over the whole set. You know, so... That very well could have stopped the film in its tracks. Uh, So, yeah, Tony really saved the day there, that's for sure. And if anybody hasn't seen the film, it packs such a heart and warmth about it. So it's certainly a film that I can recommend to go and watch for sure. And let's look at creating a style for a film when collaborating with a director. What are your main cues that you're looking for by way of the director explaining to you about the approach of the style he or she is wanting to take? All of that information, key slices to understand and get in sync with the director. What are some of those cues for you, Grips? Uh, I remember when I first uh, got a phone call to go and shoot a Hollywood movie, a movie called Tap, and this was a film about tap dancers. It's probably a a look that wasn't discussed, actually. I have the producer coming to me and saying, Dick Vane was a producer, and he comes and says, like, Gribbs, um, director's getting a bit worried about the look. What what is the look? (laughs) You know, and we hadn't discussed anything. Because I just come from shooting in movies in Australia, no one talked about that. You just employed a cinematographer and he gave it his interpretation of that look. And because there are all these old tap dancers, I was sort of doing a thing with burning out the windows to white, They're using atmosphere. It was sort of an old, if you look at old photographs, you sort of get that look. And it's funny, I had to think of a look to tell him. I go, uh, well, I was just going to do it because I liked the way that looked. But it turns out he liked that look, you know, okay. As far as uh, discussing with the director beforehand, it's the same thing about chatting and having a, you know, a glass of wine or a coffee or a meal with the director, trying to get the essence of what they want, you know. I haven't got to a situation where I haven't agreed, I must admit, with a director. And like if you said, okay, I want everything to be overexposed or something like that, you'd have to go, (laughs) okay, okay. It's not my favourite look, <laughs> you know. I want it to be two starts hot. Okay, well, that's maybe the exteriors are like that because it's in the outback and that's what it feels like. But when you're inside, when you walk from that and you walk inside, it always is dark and the windows are hot. So you probably have to chat that through, otherwise you'll end up with this overexposed interior and it will just jolt because in reality, what, that's what happens. You walk from that hot light and you come inside and your eyes haven't adjusted and the windows are hot and you can even do that. You can say, okay, well, as we walk into this thing, it sort of starts like that. And as we move through the scene, your eyes adjust. Could we like simulate that? So usually you can work something out and it's usually within the bounds of sort of what you like, you know? And coming back to that movie Tap, which I think was back in 1989, you also got the opportunity to work with Sammy Davis Jr. I'm interested to know if Sammy Davis Jr. was telling you how to lie to him or not. Sammy Davis was uh, a funny guy. I liked him a lot. I I got him a a didgeridoo as a present from Australia. My sort of lighting is uh, I like soft light through a frame. So for dark skin, it's good. And I had a problem with the lab at that point. They were, it's a cheap film, so the hot processing was in. I was actually having to do some tricky stuff with little lamps pointing into a filter on the, on the front of the camera, like a, a low-contrast LC filter to flatten out the image because I had the latest Primo lenses that the biggest thing was contrast. They introduced good contrast, and I had to fight it all the way through the film. So I was always looking for bare globes and things hanging in there. Sammy Davis, he got the crew on a Friday night to come to his house and have drinks and food. And the operator was a bit bleary the next day because we shot a Saturday. He'd always be on set, you know. A lot of actors, they disappear. And I'd be taking a reading and I always kept standing on Sammy's feet. I go, sorry, sorry, Sammy. And the lighting was like 
all worked in that. We have one scene uh, shooting in Times Square, a track through the window to look at the scenery out there and pull back in to see Sammy, right? And it's night, so it's a bit harder to light a darker-skinned person that then. And then Sammy's face is, like, quite flat, you know, and I'm going everything I could do. I couldn't get, like, a shine on him. So for, like, it's the only time in the whole film I had to point a light at him. You can't underestimate the amount of, like, how much light you have to put under somebody, you know, and you're going, you put the meter up, the needle goes doing, and you go, you look at the eyepiece and go, this isn't going to work. Uh, so you have to go by eye. And that was the only time I had, uh, I had any problem with lighting, uh, Sammy, apart from stepping on his feet all the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I made sure I had dark walls, you know. I had a production designer that was an a Academy Award-winning wardrobe person, but she wasn't a production designer. And I'm going, I'd like these mid-tone grey walls in the dance studio and a so-and-so or whatever. And she goes, yes, but there's black people. And I go, exactly. I don't want to be spending all my time cutting light off the walls when I'm wanting to light the people, you know. So the walls, if they're a bit darker, will absorb that and the people will stand out more because you're not fighting a white wall with a, a dark face, you know. She didn't really understand that until she saw some rushes and then she wanted to turn every set into a grey wall. I go, no, 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 <laughs> we don't. We can have like a, a beige, dark beige colour or something, you know. In fact, this funny thing is that there was a guy... I was transferring some of tap at a, a video place for a demo reel. Black guy was asking, who was running the machine, goes like, how are you lighting? And I said, oh, well, I had previous experience lighting tires, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, like tires, because it's black and you can't, and it's wet on a road doing car commercials, and you can't rely upon the reading of anything, you know. So my experience of lighting dark things was came from commercials. You have to reflect light. You can't point a light at somebody, only in desperation. As a cinematographer, you're constantly lighting faces, but it's a very nuanced way from actor to actor to bring out their highlights, or in some cases, to tone their highlights down, depending on story and tone. For our indie filmmakers, I wonder if you could share some of the most important things that you do when you're setting up a shot on an actor's face. Well, what I have usually done was I would get a bare globe and I would take stills of where light from the left, light above, light below, light. I'd do a circle around the people taking stills and to put into my memory of which side is the best side to light certain actors from. And you've got that to look at. You can probably never look at it again. You sort of absorb it into your head and, and taking into account what the actor is playing in the film. Also, I think it instills a little bit of confidence into the actor that you care about how they look because you're actually making an effort to do something. But generally, I tend to believe my lighting is um, I like faces, not places. Well, David Gribble, it's been great finding out more about your cinematography work. I think a lot of our indie filmmakers have certainly learned something from an experienced cine such as yourself. I look forward to seeing what comes next in your career. And thank you so much for coming on to Shoot It Now. Well, it's been a lot of fun, mate. I've forgotten some of the stories that I have been telling you today. And I've got a lot more if you ever want to come back. You've been listening to Shoot It Now with Craig Newland, your weekly podcast about all things behind the camera and in front of it. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you.